William Smith College where she studied fine arts and studio arts and studied cooking in Italy and Ireland. Oh. She is co-founder of the Cook's Garden in Southern Vermont and a founding member of the Vermont Fresh Network and a member of numerous other organizations, including Slow Food USA and the International Society of Culinary Professionals, as well as gardening organizations. She has authored two books and numerous articles, and she will speak today on her new book, which came out in February, The New Heirloom Garden. I guess that's my cue to start. That's your cue, Ellen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, my. Well, it's great to see your faces, faces without masks. And um, I jumped on the call a little bit ahead of time so I could get to hear a little bit about your group. And it sounds like you're all in different places. You're not just all in one place, which is really cool. Um, I'm excited about that. So I'm going to be talking today about growing food. Food. And um, if I were with you, I'd ask you to all raise your hands and tell me how many of you grow food now. Um, but I bet you all grow flowers. And so I'm hoping that by the end of my talk, I may have um, convinced some of you to um, grow food as well as flowers. Um, I am, um, I'm, I've been, uh, I'm now a co-host, so I'm going to screen share with you. But before I start, I, there are a couple things I wanted to mention in that I'm from Southern Vermont. I live in Manchester, which is um, near um, Dorset. Maybe some of you know Dorset. And um, I, um, but I grew up in Weston, Massachusetts. I went to Weston High School and then I went to art school at Montserrat School of Visual Arts in Beverly. So, you know, I know the area. My mom um, lives on Cape Cod, actually Chatham. I, I think you mentioned Chatham, Victoria. So we'll have to talk afterwards. And she also lives at Newbury Court in Concord. So, you know, I'm very familiar with the Boston area. I feel um, it, it's home to me. So, um, and this weekend I'll be in Chatham helping her sift her compost and getting it on her flower bed. She's 94 years old and she still gardens like crazy. So I think that's a real tribute to gardeners. It keeps us healthy um, and it keeps us looking forward to spring all the time. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start screen sharing and I'm, what I'm, going to, I'm going to share with you a lot of beautiful photos and you may be at a point in your life where you don't want to put in a garden or maybe you have a garden and you don't feel like changing anything. Um, so just sit back and enjoy the ride. Um, there'll be some, you know, little inspiration maybe along the way and hopefully you'll get a few ideas of, of ways that you'll either like to tweak your garden to make it more enjoyable or, um, you know, maybe start a new garden this year. So let me see if I can find this screen share thing. It's usually right there at the bottom. For some reason, I can't seem to find it. It's down here somewhere, right? Screen share, there we go. Um, all right, we didn't really practice this before, but I assume everybody can see me okay? Yes? Good, great, thank you. I'm gonna minimize this little box for me and, um, and then I'll just start talking. So this talk is called The New Heirloom Garden, um, which is really based on my new book. I'm not gonna um, share that much about my new book because my mom always taught me not to plug my books, um, but, uh, I do have a book also called The New Heirloom Garden, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about spring and that this is um, probably how we're all feeling right now. I can't stop gardening. This is from uh, The New Yorker. And um, it is a little bit of how I feel right now. This weekend was the first time I was able to get out and dig in the soil and I made my wish list of seeds and I heard you all talking about going to the garden centers and um, you know, it's just like one of those things, my car goes on autopilot into every garden center. I just can't stop gardening. So anyways, it's a very exciting time of year. Um, but really my, my, my story starts with uh, back in 1980 when my husband was the gardener and I was the cook. He, uh, we both graduated from art school and he wanted to move to Vermont and grow a big garden and sell organic local vegetables to the local chefs. And I, I of course thought that was the silliest idea but being a newlywed I went along with it. So we moved to Vermont to his grandfather's farm and I had a design business at that time. I was making quilted vests and jackets and I was selling them to the Talbot's catalog back in 1980. Um, 
And so I had a little design business and I thought if he fails at growing vegetables, at least we have my income. Um, but I found out that I really enjoyed having the fresh organic vegetables because I really love to cook. And so we had a wonderful division of labor. I was the cook and he was the gardener. And we set up a little farm stand down in the center of Londonderry, Vermont, which had a year round population of about 1500 people. So we didn't sell very much, but we had a really beautiful farm stand, uh, both being artistic. We, we had a, a penchant for making things look very aesthetic. Um, but at the end of the day, we would often come home and have to put some a lot of our vegetables on the compost pile. Um, but as the cook, I um, came up with a lot of recipes to try and convince people to grow some of these beautiful vegetables that we were growing and selling at the farm stand. Um, my husband didn't want me to be a gardener, so he made it look as um, hard like hard work, you know, he'd go out and dawn and rake in the soil and drag the hoses around. And he always came in at the end of the day with just covered with, with dirt from head to toe. And I was working with fabric. So I really didn't want to be a gardener. It really didn't appeal to me at all, but I really loved being a cook. Um, so by and by, we started a little catalog called the Cook's Garden. And I'm not going to get too much into this because I could probably take a whole lecture um, hour to tell you about it. But but uh, my husband wasn't really happy with some of the vegetables that we were getting from Burpee and Harris Seed. And I think Johnny's was around then because a lot of the vegetables were the same things we could buy in the grocery store. And we had a friend who had gone to, um, to Europe and had brought us some seeds back from Italy of a little salad green that was called rucola. Well, we thought rucola, that's a funny name. What, what, do you, what does this look like? And it, on the packet, it looked like, like a little green leaf and, and we sowed the seed and it grew very quickly and we tasted it and it was bitter and horrible, but we added it to a salad and we thought, well, I guess this is different. We, I guess we could sort of like this. And, and um, unbeknownst to me, my husband wrote away to this Italian seed catalog and he ordered more rucola as well as about 60 different types of Italian chicories and artichokes and all kinds of other um, Italian vegetables because he wanted to know what, um, what else we could grow besides iceberg lettuce and, and tender green beans. Well, what he didn't tell me was that the minimum order was 100 kilos. And when Logan Airport called us and said, your seeds are, have arrived, uh, we, I, I shook my head and didn't know what we were going to do with all these seeds. That's a lot of seeds, 100, 100 kilos of seed, thinking back on it now. Um, but, you know, we were newlyweds, so I just kind of laughed and thought, well, you know, seeds are not like wine and cheese. They don't get better with age. So we had to start a seed catalog called the Cook's Garden because I was the cook and he was the gardener. Um, and we specialized in lettuce and salad greens. We had, of course, arugula, but we also had this beautiful little salad green called Claytonia and this little chicory called a Cheriola and this trout back lettuce, which is an old heirloom variety, also known as Forellenschuss um, or speckled uh, trout back. And, and my job was to go through the garden and taste everything and write a description. And since we didn't have color photographs the way I'm showing them to you now, I had to come up with a description for how things tasted and the flavor and how long it took to grow in the garden and, and really convince the, the customers why they would want to grow things like this Rosa de Verona chicory or the Beyond Elise chicory or these wonderful purple um, artichokes and, and why they were different and why they were special. Well, I really didn't understand chicory. We had a lot of it in our catalog and we didn't sell very much of it. Um, the, the catalog took off very quickly. We found there were a lot of other gardeners who were interested in some of these Italian uh, heirloom vegetables because well, you know, they would traveled to Italy and France and Switzerland and they had tasted them there and then they'd come home to the ho-hum vegetables. And so they decided they wanted to grow them as well. But chicory was one of those crops that we just really couldn't convince anybody to, to try. So um, I signed up for cooking school um, with Marcella Hazan in Venice, Italy. 
Um, it was a, a 10 day class. It wasn't, you know, a full um, six month course, but it was just enough for me to understand Marcella's um, love for Italian vegetables. Um, but unfortunately in her class, she didn't really cover chicory. And when she asked um, after class, does anybody have any questions? I would raise my hand and say, are we gonna learn about chicory? And she'd say, oh, Americans don't like bitter, bitter foods. Why would you wanna know about chicories? And I tried to explain, I had the seed catalog and I needed to come up with some recipes and she um, would have none of it. So I decided, I guess I'm not gonna learn about chicories, but I did find that um, there was a beautiful chicory in the Rialto market, the, the Pontarella, which is featured here. And I brought it to class one day and we had a little bit of extra time. So she showed us how to prepare that Pontarella chicory with lemon and olive oil and salt, and it was delicious. So I came home with one recipe um, and my husband was, um, um, really excited that I had such a good time in Italy. And he said, where would you like to go next year? And I said, well, I'd heard about this wonderful cooking school in Shanagary, Ireland called Ballymolo. And um, at Ballymolo, um, that not only did you learn about cooking, but you actually went into the garden and you harvested your own herbs and your own vegetables. And, and then there was a cooking class and, but it was combining the garden and the kitchen together. So I realized when I walked into this garden at Ballymolo the following year, and this must have been, oh, I don't know, 1998 or something, um, I walked through this beautiful green hedge that was alive with birds and into this fragrant herb garden that had boxwood and lovage and lavender and celery and, and, er, and oregano, everything was just filling my senses. And then standing on a little platform, I was able to look down into this garden and, and realize that this garden was absolutely magnificent and and if I could grow a beautiful food garden that it could turn work into play that what my husband was doing was was just looked like so much work but I realized that designing a nice garden really there was a, a huge potential for me to actually enjoy gardening so this is really when I became a gardener um, step number one design plan always keep something beautiful in your mind when I realized I wanted to be a gardener I had to convince my husband been number one that he needed to allow me to be a gardener, um, but also that we needed to design our garden in a way that made it more beautiful. Um, and at first we ha I had no idea what to do, but then I found this picture of Rosemary Veery's design of a beautiful garden. I believe it's in Kentucky. Um, it's not my garden, I wish it were, but I learned from this garden so many things about design that I'm gonna share with you today. One is the focal point. You probably know, have heard the focal point and either it's in the center of the garden or it's at the end of the garden, this beautiful white bench here, walking into this orchard, which of course is, is unusual in that it has square instead of circular uh, beds around each of the trees. But if that focal point that is there, it makes you draw into that space and want to go and sit down on that bench. And then these little things called tutors or, um, you know, the trellises to, that often people use in a vegetable garden to grow beans and peas, but in this case, they're purely ornamental. And then notice this little square garden here, this beautiful um, little square garden that could just be long straight rows if it were just an ordinary vegetable garden, but instead, um, Rosemary Veery has divided it into a triangular garden and each one of these little beds is, is surrounded by germander or a low boxwood hedge or, or even just a fine leaf basil. So there were a lot of elements here that I studied that, that taught me how to design a garden. Um, now this is not my garden either, but this is a fairly typical vegetable garden in Vermont. I'm sure it's not your garden. I'm sure your garden is much more beautiful than this, but this has elements that we're going to talk about today that can be transformed. Um, the gate and the fence, the mulching in the paths, the, the pollinators in the background here and the little Buddha under the tree. But where I'm gonna take you to today with um, in your mind's eye is a garden that looks more like this, which is the same size, but it has texture and color and um, plant material which which combines food and flowers together and it has a focal point here with this rustic trellis in the center and it has a little bench under this hidden secret arbor here and and notice these trellises that give the the garden height and drama and these are all things that I I learned just by visiting a lot of gardens so I didn't go to um, design school I mean I went to art school but I didn't go to garden design school but I 
I was pretty good at paying attention to what makes a beautiful garden, but I still wasn't sure where ideas come from. It took me a while to really realize that most of my best ideas have actually come from other gardeners and just visiting gardens, which I have done really all my life now, all my adult life. I find that, and I heard you talk about this in, in, your, um, in your meeting that you're going to visit gardens because there's nothing more fun than coming home with some fresh ideas um, for gardens. But what I'm going to share with you today is what I call my six steps to success. And these are the six steps that I noticed in most everybody's flower gardens. And then I've really just translated them into uh, the vegetable garden, starting with chapter one, design, and then looking at beds and paths and fences and plants. And then how do you add your personality to this garden? How do we take the same three th things, seeds, soil, and plants, and, and turn it into a beautiful garden? Well, um, in my garden, it starts by taking an overview of the garden. I, I teach garden design classes online and also at various places like Tower Hill. And, and I'm teaching one this, this Friday at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. And, and I often say, pretend you're a bird and you fly up and you look down at your garden and have an overview of, of not just your landscape, but how it connects to all the land around you. Um, you know, we have these things called defined boundaries but really, when you look at land, it's 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 not um, it's not based on any kind of property line. There's maybe a stream that's feeding the the moisture in the in the in the soil, or or trees that are shading certain areas. So thinking how everything fits together, and then and then zooming in on the small design. So I call it big design, small design. But really, when I first started, I had to go back and and look in my art history books and figure out where that first uh, kitchen garden was documented. And it went back to the Paradise Gardens back in, um, in BC times, 1500 BC in, in, in Islam and in Persia, when these Paradise Gardens were, were really a place of, of hope and prayer and meditation. And, and it was about uh, communing with nature. All of these beautiful gardens have, have animals and plants um, um, featured nearby and they were often designed on a four square design that that had the four sacred liquids of life running through milk, water, wine, and honey. And these four squares represented east, west, north, and south and the, the bigger world beyond the garden. And then fast forward down to the, um, up to the, I'm not sure if it's up or down, to medieval times uh, where, where anything pleasurable was outlawed and gardens moved behind the high walls of monasteries where the nuns and the monks would, would tend to them. And often these gardens were, were um, places of meditation and prayer and, and nurturing and, and fed not just people, but um, the animals and, and were a source of life um, and based on a geometric grid when you go back and you look at at the um the footprint of a lot of these monasteries that are no longer still, um, uh, you know, still uh, structures, but just have the, the garden design plans. You can see that there's a lot of uh, four square gardens going on because everything was very geometric. And then um, the geometric design continued through the gardens in France during the Renaissance of the Chateau de Villandry and the Chateau de Versailles. And maybe many of you have seen these ma majestic gardens and you know the history history of them and, and orderliness is next to godliness and everything is trimmed and neat and, and orderly. Um, and these four squares uh, uh, persisted. The four squares have the red and green cabbage with the flowers in the center, or then these gardens here, which are also based on a four square. And there's many variations of that four square design featured in all of these um, magnificent gardens in France. Um, and then in Colonia Williamsburg, you see the four square design, the parterre, which is uh, often uh, featured in the kitchen gardens around the small village. And that the outside of the, the, the village at um, Colonia Williamsburg are where the, the bigger crops are grown. And these four squares are really all about just the, the simple herbs and, and flowers and um, the things that the cook would use on a daily basis. And again, this, this four square with the beautiful focal point in the center. Um, so when I started writing my first book, The Complete Kitchen Garden, which was in 2011, is when it came out. Nope. 
the first my first book was 2003 which was a cookbook but my first design book was the complete kitchen garden in 2011 and i i was very much um a fan of these four square gardens the parterre and i needed to come up with variations on the four square because i really feel that not only are they beautiful but they also follow an organic crop rotation this is the way my garden looked uh, last spring when i started planting it and that four square organic crop rotation is what gardeners have used for centuries, really to keep the soil healthy and the plants healthy. When you start with legumes, the, the um, beans and the peas in one bed, and then you move those to where the roots have been growing, the roots are the carrots and the onions, and they've been absorbing a lot of the nutrition and nitrogen from the soil, and the legumes will build that nitrogen back into the soil. And then the roots follow where the fruits and flowers have been, and often the fruits and the flowers, the, the cucumbers and the squash, or where you get a lot of pests and disease. So they'll move into another bed um, and into the leafy greens. And then the leafy greens will grow into where the legumes have been growing um, because the legumes have been setting nitrogen into the soil. And it's called a four-year crop rotation. And it follows very nicely in that um, in that parterre design. So when you're thinking about design, um, you know, maybe it's a, it's a four square design that, that makes the garden not only productive and healthy, but also very beautiful. Uh, so step number two are garden beds. Um, I love this, this quote, an optimistic gardener is one who believes that whatever goes down, whatever goes down must come up. Um, and garden beds can be very simple. Um, you, you know, this is a standard design, which is flush to the soil, um, which uh, is how my garden grows. I like being able to step into the garden um, and it just helps me it, rather than lean into the garden. I think people think that raised beds are better for your back. I don't agree with that. I believe stepping in and then squatting in the garden to be able to to um, to weed and, and pull and harvest is, is much better for your back than raised beds. But but garden beds, you know, really are a matter of personal opinion. Um, but the other reason I love a raised bed is, I mean, a, a, a standard bed, which is because it's a, a a vegetable garden is where you're growing a lot of annuals and a lot of those annuals are going to change every year. So that garden bed can be a blank canvas um, much more easily than a flower garden can be and, and where you can't necessarily change up the perennials every year, but you can add annuals. But a vegetable garden, you can you can make it different every year. And this, this gardener decided this year she was going to make the sun ray garden with the lemon gem in the center, center all with the spokes leading out around the edges. But so often people put in raised beds and I can understand they're easier. Um they take up less room, especially if you have a, a tight yard or you live in an urban area. These are wonderful cedar raised beds that are made on in Chatham, actually Chatham Cape Cod by the farmstead. And um, he makes them by production and sells them to other places like Gardener Supply and some other places. But I think they're very um, aesthetic with the mortise and tenon um, type of closure. But so often raised beds are four feet wide and, and six feet long and, and people stack them right at next to each other and I um, sometimes refer to it as the graveyard garden when you have a little bit of a snow dusting and you you're not quite sure what's under those mounds so I I often recommend gardeners um, make their raised bed gardens maybe not so linear and and perhaps dress it up a little bit with some nice potted plants and and give it a little vertical element such as these bent bamboos to, to make it more whimsical um, another option for raised beds would be granite stone. This is a, a garden in Northwest Connecticut and uh, they were digging up the sidewalks and putting in new stone and and this gardener said hey you can just drop those stones in my yard and and she used them for a, a lovely a little stone raised bed um, and the stone is good because it holds in the heat it's a nice feature of stone and and crops can be grown a little earlier in the spring because the soil is heating up and a little later in the fall as well another example of a of lovely garden bed is are these uh, wattle fences from the Chanticleer garden and Chanticleer is in Pennsylvania if any of you have have gone to to tour some of those lovely gardens in the Brandywine region um, be sure to stop and see the Chanticleer garden and and they actually grow this willow in the, in the back they have a swampy area and they grow all their own willow and this is a living willow archway also featured in the garden which I think is so magnificent 
Um, and maybe uh, again, Stone, this is the Cornell Botanic Garden. And I, I visited obviously on a rainy day in the fall, but um, I love this garden. I thought that, that their, their collection of plants was, was better than anything I'd ever seen. Uh, but what I loved about their garden beds is they actually built in some lovely little seats. So if you got tired walking around the garden, you could, you could have a seat and rest your feet. Um, step number three, garden paths. And we all know that paths are the bones of the garden and, and get you from one place to the other. And I, I particularly like this garden path because it, it ha it, it's decorative with uh, using two different um, materials here, the clamshells. This is at Colonial Williamsburg again. And, and notice this wonderful um, boxy uh, bed here. This is like the one we saw in the first picture uh, by with Rosemary Veery and that this is is a design um, that uses a, a square, which turns it into a triangle, which is really nice. But there is one thing that they're missing here. I wish they had a nice white bench here at the end as a focal point in this garden. But as we know, paths are really the bones of the garden. They're, they're the structure, they're the, the foundation and, and planning those paths is very important in terms of how you're going to have the beds um, not be quite so cluttered. Um, and uh, I love the way this path is designed so that it, it goes from the driveway into the house and along the way the gardener can, can pluck her lettuce and her peas and the chicory. Um, but I do think that this might, um, this is a little bit of probably not very good planning. You can see this is raised bed a little bit and I bet when it rains it, it falls into the pathway a little bit. So maybe a board that holds that soil in. But I love this kind of um, leading into the house uh, feeling of this this garden path. And this is a wonderful garden up in Charlotte, Vermont. And um, this brick and the wonderful New Hampshire granite stone, these wonderful blocks um, hold in the foundation for this garden. And, and you can see they've gotten a little bit crooked over the years, but they still keep the foundation and they have a lot of personality. And I, I think it's nice because it's not so high that it looks like a raised bed, but it gives it just enough um, uh, delineation from the path and holds back the soil. Um, the gardens at Hollister House are also my favorite and and um, I think what gives it so much charm are the the paths because they don't weed the paths they don't try and get those brick paths completely clean and clear with you know some people take um, a chemical and and spray the weeds out of their paths but instead they cultivate their weeds they they have the red perilla which has escaped the garden bed and and jumped into the path and and it, it gives it a, a lovely personality and these are tiny flowers foxgloves that are growing and and later in the season these will be wonderful magnificent um, unplanned flowers in the garden and so I love the naturalness of this path which which gives it a, 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 a sort of an aged look to this garden and notice this bench here nobody's sitting on that bench so they've allowed the nepeta just to grow through it instead of um, weeding it so there's a, a lot of wisdom to just letting the volunteers do their thing. Another thing about paths is um, it's very good for dog training. This is my little dog, Bella, when I was first starting the, the new garden I have at, at my current house. And, and she was learning that she couldn't go in the garden and, and dig that garden. And by mid-July, she was, she was very well trained. She was an Australian uh, border, a cattle dog mix kind of um, dog. Um, but notice my paths are four feet wide, which looks very wide in this picture, but that's how they were designed so that I could walk two by two in that garden. Um, and then by mid-August, when I realized I hadn't uh, trained the, the cucumbers and the melons to go up the trellis, I was very glad to have that four foot wide path. But the other thing about paths is it could be the one thing that you change up. Um, I used to have a tomato red paint on my living room and I recently painted it to blue um, and it's so much nicer to sit in that room. It doesn't feel so sort of hot and, and vibrant. Instead it has a cool calming effect on me and the same is, is true with my path. I recently changed it to be Riverstone instead of Bark Mulch and I feel it really brought out the colors of the plants and um, it was a very inexpensive thing to change and it made such a difference in how I feel about being in my garden. So step number four, fences and gates. 
Um, Penelope Hobhouse says, gardens are the result of a collaboration between art and nature. And I think we all know that, but we don't often say that. And fences and gates are a, a great example because often we set fences up as a way to keep things out. And I know all of you probably have trouble with deer and rabbits and, and um, I once had a, a groundhog that was eating everything and, and having a good fence was, was a real temptation. But I often I often like to think of fences as being um, a beautiful picture frame around your garden. When I was in art school, we weren't allowed to turn a painting in and say it was finished unless it had a, a picture frame around that garden. And this is a perfect example of everything being contained within that garden. And, and notice the, um, the other uh, lesson here of the four squares and the little tutor in the center as a focal point and the stepping stone paths. And, and this gardener also put a, a table and chairs out in her greenhouse, which I think is such a lovely idea. Idea. And inside this little garden shed, which is, is very close to the garden and built into the original plan, she keeps a refrigerator there. So when she's entertaining in the garden, she has a way to have chilled wine easily accessible. And so maybe that's the one thing that you take home with you today is put a refrigerator in your garden. Um, um, another example of a, of a very simple natural fence is this garden in Charlotte and I uh, this was taken early in the spring you can see the the robust green sprouts of the garlic coming up in this wonderful strawberry trellis that has not yet been planted but by mid-August this is what the the garden looks like and I I love the way it has this picture frame around it of the natural fence and it holds it in and it would be a very different garden if it didn't have that that fence around it um, and I know it's not keeping deer out but there are different ways to keep deer and I have a, a slide coming up to show you but there are ways that I have seen about how um, you can put a little post up here and then run some wire around the outside and it won't look like such a batting cage this is a garden in Chatham the, the Dunbar's garden maybe you you visited on a garden conservancy tour and I I love the way um, she has painted this garden a, 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 a a Benjamin Moore historic blue gray that really picks up the the sage of the sage color of the sage and the the wonderful blue gray of the lavender and is really um, I just I just love blue in the garden actually and and the way it contrasts with the yellow um, sunflowers in the background or putting up a wonderful gate that that creates that transition from the lawn into the garden I kind of think of the gate as as that wonderful um, that uh, story of Narnia where um, the lion the witch and the wardrobe and walking in through that gate and into the garden and closing that gate behind you you're entering into a space that is is really quite magical and and exciting um, uh, another great example of deer fence here, um, this wonderful gardener, he's, he's, I don't know who he is, but I love his garden and I actually like his raised beds because they're nice and high, but notice he's probably also a woodworker. He's created this wonderful um, arbor across. This is a, a photo from my new book and my photographer knows who he is, but I don't, I don't, but I would, um, I would like to get to know him and, and learn more about how he designed this with the wonderful deer fence. Look at the hardware cloth there that, that keeps the deer out, but also creates a, a lovely effect as he walks in through under that gate, under that grape arbor, arbor and, and also keeps out all the pests as well. Um, this garden isn't going to keep anything out particularly, but I love the simplicity of this iron gate. It just fits um, the design. And so when you're, you're finding a gate to put across your garden, find something that, that really resonates with, with the elegance of the garden and how it all fits together. Um, this is a garden from my first book and I call it the garnish garden because this gardener loves to grow food and flowers together and I, I especially um, take joy in the way she has alternated her flowers and her food with the calendula and the poppies mixed in with the lettuce and, and the dill and the spinach and the, the onions and back here are raspberries and, and she just has this delicate rustic trellis that, that creates that transition from the lawn into the garden with, with the old fashioned Grandpa Otts growing up it. And, and um, it's not keeping deer out, but um, somehow she hasn't seemed to have problem with deer. 
So step number five, seeds and plants. Listen to your broccoli and your broccoli will tell you how to eat it. Um, I love this quote, especially um, because most people wouldn't necessarily understand it, but if you're a food gardener, you know there's a big difference between that broccoli you buy in the grocery store for $1.49 and, and the broccoli that you are growing in your garden that has taken 95 days from seed to harvest. And, and when you harvest your own broccoli, you're probably going to talk to it. Maybe you'll even post it on Instagram. Um, and you know you're going to really savor it and, and appreciate that broccoli far more than the, the food that you grow. Um, and since this talk is called the heirloom garden, I thought I would take a moment and say, what is an heirloom garden? You know, we've really just been talking about design and, and features of an heirloom garden. Um, but I'm going to start talking a little bit about the plants in an heirloom garden. And the word heirloom, um, heir means inheritance and loom means tool. So an heirloom garden is a way to pass along something of value without written document or legal settlement. And in, in the case of heirloom, it means seeds and plants. Um, and so many of the, the seeds and plants featured in my new book and in my own heirloom garden are foods that have a lot of flavor and fragrance and that you won't be able to buy in the grocery store. And so some of my favorites are naturally peas because peas are a very easy crop to save seed. We, every time we eat a pea, we're eating seeds, but if you let a few of those seeds um, dry and wither on the vine and then open them up at the end of the season, you're going to have pea seeds that you can actually grow the following year because heirloom seeds are open pollinated seeds. And open pollinated means you can grow them again year after year um, versus a hybrid seed, which is something that you often find in a catalog that has more disease resistance, um, but is not necessarily um, able to grow back from seed. Either the seed is sterile or it's seed that um, will not grow back to the parent plant because it's been crossbred for so many um, generations. But really seed catalogs are something that are a fairly recent invention. You know, we've become, um, we've become accustomed to the convenience of seed catalogs so that we don't have to save our seeds. And, and we value the burpee um, tomato, the matchless tomato that, that was offered before there was such a thing called an heirloom tomato. And heirloom seeds really mean seeds that were, were um, available before 1950 when the hybrid um, modality of seeds became the standard seeds for seed catalogs. And seed catalogs were kind of excited to offer heirloom not only could they offer seeds with disease resistance and, and better vigor, or so they said, um, but it meant that nobody could save their seeds anymore, that they had to buy them. So um, the truth about seeds is that you can grow your own seed. You can let some of that beautiful lettuce that's growing in your garden just turn into a seed head. This is a, a red deer tongue lettuce that uh, was growing in my garden. And I, I love the red deer tongue. And of course I can buy deer, red deer tongue lettuce from um, the Seed Savers Exchange or other heirloom seed catalogs. But I've grown so that I really love the way um, seeds when they're going to flower look in my garden. Um, and I love the way beans and peas especially uh, transform from an edible into something that's totally inedible. But then I save the seeds in jars and it's really the, the easiest um, starter plant to, to begin with if you're just starting to think about start saving your own seeds. Um, these, this is a wonderful, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm getting confused here. I think this is a soybean um, and this is an edamame bean and there's dragon tongue and there's cranberry beans and there's yellow beans and there's green annelino and there's all kinds of beans and peas and legumes that you can save so easily just by, by allowing one or two of the plants in your garden to um, last all season until it's ready to be harvested in the fall. And when you harvest those beans, you'll be absolutely amazed by the way they look inside. This is a chocolate runner bean and it looks just like a regular bean when it's growing. But at the end of the season, when you open those pods, you're going to have these 
gorgeous little Easter egg gems um, that open up. So it's a wonderful thing to do with your grandchildren as well. Um, the other thing I grow a lot of are herbs and all herbs really are heirloom, um, even though most of us don't start them from seed and having er er fresh herbs in a kitchen garden, I think is absolutely essential. And I always have recipes in my books because as a cook who loves to garden, I, I feel that putting uh, recipes and designs in my book is important. And this is a, a wonderful herb cheese bread that is really just, um, uh, what is it, flour and yeast and herbs and cheese and, and water. And then um, once you start making bread again and, and smell it baking in the oven, I think you'll, you'll probably um, start baking bread every week because it's so, such a delight. And of course, basil is in everybody's garden. Everybody grows sweet Genovese basil. And I, I know this because having been in the seed business, I know that everybody's order always started off with sweet Genovese basil. And it was one of those seeds that we often ran out and had to keep ordering more from Italy. Um, and one, one time I actually did some research about how many basils there were. And I wrote a little book about basil um, and found that there are 85 different kinds of basil that you can grow. You can grow the opal basil, the sweet Genovese basil, a cinnamon basil, maybe uh, a lemon basil or a lettuce leaf basil that grows a leaf the size of your hand and you can put a piece of fish in it and grill it on the grill or a piccolo verde basil, which is a tiny little leaf basil, which has um, a very pungent leaf that makes the best pesto. So um, maybe you'd like to try growing a little bit of, of, of different kinds of basil this year. I, I have an 80-20 rule, which I often say grow 80% uh, tried and true things you always love and 20% new and different. And um, mescaline is something I always put in my garden. And this is something you can plant right now on a, on a pot on your patio in your garden or, or in a sunny window still. And mescaline really me just means miscellaneous greens. It's, it's uh, a combination of wild chicories and arugula and lettuces and, and things that, um, you know, the, the peasants once uh, were, this was their, their harvest in the spring because there's nothing like fresh um, chicory, the bitter, bitter greens, which are a wonderful tonic for your system. Um, and I often grow mescaline in individual packets because when you get a mixed packet of mescaline, there's different, maybe 12 to 15 different kinds of greens in that packet and they'll all grow at different rates. And so when you are sowing your own combination of different greens, you're going to get really the best um, mescaline gloom for your salad bowl. And something like rainbow chard is, has become a favorite of mine. I, I learned several recipes for rainbow chard when I went to cooking school um, with Marcella Hazon. Um, and what I love most about rainbow chard, it's a, it's a cut and come again. So if you're not actually using it, it you, you'll get a weaker plant, but the more you harvest, the more you'll get. And so for every three stems you, stems you harvest, you'll get six more stems coming back. So it's a wonderful plant to, to start this time of year and it will grow all the way through you know, November to Thanksgiving. And then endive and chicory and all of those Mediterranean greens, they're a wonderful crop to grow, especially in midsummer when, when lettuce doesn't germinate, when, when it's over um, 82 degrees, I think. And, and so really just finding some endives and, and chicories that you like to add to your salad will really add to your, your beautiful um, kitchen garden. And something like iceberg lettuce, you know, we, I don't, I guess they still sell iceberg lettuce in the grocery store. It used to be the, the most popular lettuce, but you'd never seen a red iceberg lettuce in the grocery store. And it's really too bad because I think it's absolutely beautiful. And um, it's just a reminder when you look at a gorgeous head of lettuce like this of how beautiful food can be and, and how many of us are, are really putting a lot of our attention into our flowers when I think we could be growing more beautiful edible food gardens when we're growing some really luscious uh, old fashioned heirloom varieties of lettuce. And uh, edible flowers, there's so many wonderful edible flowers you can grow. If you wanted to, to really branch out and try different nasturtiums, I, one year I grew 21 different kinds of nasturtium. I, I grow milkmaid, which is a white blossom or moonlight, which is a pale yellow, little, yellow blossom. And it, it's a trailing type of, of nasturtium. And then of course there's Vesuvius, which is a, um, a ragged edged blossom. And there's lots of different kinds of, of nasturtium. And it's a fun little peppery uh, flower 
and leaf to add to the salad. And something like this, the lemon gem marigold, which is so has a wonderful fragrant foliage or the, the blue uh, blossom of a borage flower is, is not only gorgeous, but it's very nutritious. And then remembering that there's a lot of old um, herbs that, that we no longer grow that um, were once grown and harvested as medicinal herbs, something like comfrey. Um, you probably would only need one plant of comfrey, but it's really nice to have as a, as a tea, but also to use as a, um, as a wound healer when, it, you know, as a poultice, you can make um, something to, to, if you bruise yourself in the summer and you, you masticate it and put it on the wound, it will make it heal. It's also called bone knit, I believe. Um, and cranberry beans, something like oh, old fashioned cranberry beans. I, I just can't get over how beautiful these beans are. Each one of them a completely different bean. And, and the story of, of cranberry beans really goes back to Italy when um, they have a lemon bean, which is very similar. And then um, immigrants brought the cranberry bean over to New England and uh, we started growing it here. So it got became known as the New England cranberry bean, but really its ancestors go back to the Europe European Italian lemon bean. And also the artichokes, uh, again, 80% tried and true, 20% new and different. You may not know that you can grow artichokes. And I didn't know until I tried them one year. And, and what started as four plants has now grown into uh, 12 plants. And I put them in my perennial bed because I love the way the, the thistle opens up to this magnificent blue flower. And something like alpine strawberry. It's not a strawberry you're going to find in the market, um, but it is a strawberry that is is a wonderful delicate addition to your own kitchen garden. It's a, a, a very subtle, tiny little soft berry that um, just melts on your mouth. And for me, every time I pick a handful of alpine strawberries, it, it takes me back to visiting my grandmother's garden and, and how um, my childhood of growing up with a grandmother who loved to garden and what a pleasure that was. And there's so many fruits um, that we should be growing that because we're losing the diversity of fruits, um, back in the 19th century, there were 15,000 different kinds of apple varieties, and now we're down to, to maybe 800 varieties of apples. And, and um, most people are ripping out the old heirloom orchards and putting in Honeycrisp because everybody seems to like the Honeycrisp. And not too long ago, everybody ripped out the old um, varieties for Macintosh and Macoon. So it really, you know, we're losing a lot of these wonderful old heritage varieties of, of fruits like this golden raspberry berry and the gooseberry and, and other things. So the, the uh, wonderful golden gauge plum. So finding uh, wonderful heirloom plants to put in your garden, maybe it's an apple tree or maybe it's growing heirloom tomatoes. Um, this wonderful big rainbow tomato um, wouldn't pass muster in a grocery store, but you know if you saw it at a farmer's market or picked it from your own garden, you'd know that that had um, the most um, delicious, juicy, sweet flavor. And something like potatoes, you know, we've, we've sort of given up growing potatoes, most of us who don't have a lot of space, um, but it's really too bad that in the grocery store all we can find are the red norlin and the yukon gold and the um, russet uh, where you can really be growing the french fingerling or the russian banana or maybe the peruvian purple potato which um, is such a, a treat for kids to find purple potatoes on their plate um, and the carrot, the lonely carrot, a day is coming when a single carrot will set off a revolution. Um, well, that was written over 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago. And, and you know, carrots have still not set off a revolution. Kale did a few years ago, and I don't know what the next big vegetable will be. But um, carrots are one of those heirloom um, crops that really, ever since 1950, we've, we've been losing at an incredible rate because they have been bred to have strong tops to be mechanically harvested when the, the roots are what we eat, not the tops. And if you're a gardener, you can grow heirloom varieties such as the Scarlet Nantes or the Touchon or even the Mokum carrot. And, and you're going to be able to remember what real carrot really tastes like. 
Um, so step number six, and this is the, the final step, uh, personality. All gardens are a form of autobiography. Robert Dash, the great painter. Um, and I do feel that we bring a lot of personality to our gardens. And this is what I call the frosting on the cake. Um, when I teach my garden design classes, I say, let's just have fun, you know, just, just mix it up. Try and think outside the box. And, and Jan um, and her garden really um, does that very nicely when she drives her car into her driveway she smiles because she has so many crazy things but each one of these things she puts in her garden um, makes her smile um, but maybe it's something old like an old watering can uh, maybe you have an old watering can from your grandmother's garden and it has holes in it but bring it out in the garden and and make it a, a really important significant object of the garden or or maybe you can uh, create a little haven for for having tea or in cookies with your grand children outside in the garden in a sunflower house or or finding ways to create um, a little treasure hunt in your house for kids. I often get kids to my garden and I hide things all around the garden because that not only makes them smell and taste and see things differently but it also creates memories and I think that's really what what heirloom gardens do for us is that they're full of memories of fragrance and flavors. Um, maybe it's a wonderful gate in your garden where you're you're creating a little whimsy. I love the way this gate has been designed to to mimic the round stones in the fence and that little hobbit house in the background. Or maybe it's a wonderful garden gate with rosemary. I mean, with um, the William Baffin rose growing up over it, or this rustic trellis with the Grandpa Ott's morning glory, um, and creating that transition from the lawn into that garden by um, having a little focal point there of the of the bird bath. And remembering to put a bench in your garden. I feel that oftentimes when I visit gardens, there's never enough benches for me. And it's not that I like to sit down, although I confess I do love to sit in a garden, but I feel that benches are a time for us to reflect and to observe. And, and in our busy lives, we're, we're, we don't allow ourselves that pleasure of being able just to sit and to smell and to taste and to think and close your eyes and feel the sun. And so I encourage all of you to, to find a couple of benches and, and put them in your garden and, and really take time to, to take pleasure in, in, in the great bounty of nature. Um, and thinking about how to integrate a wonderful little garden shed into your garden design and, and, and make it a useful space. Maybe it's a little getaway. This even looks like it almost has a doorbell on it, which I think is kind of funny. Um, I don't know where this garden is. I took this photo off of, of a Pinterest, but I, I am very amused by the perfection of it, but it's, it's inspiring nonetheless. And, and remembering that gardens are not just about ourselves, but really about nurturing nature and feeding nature and supporting nature and, and having wild places in nature and, and remembering to plant native plants so that you're supporting nature and, um, and, and really um, realizing that everything we do is a connection to nature. So why do heirlooms matter? Well, I think heirlooms matter because of flavor, says Rosalind Creasy, who's a, a wonderful author and um, landscape, you know, vegetable landscaper. Um, if I don't like the taste, I'm not going to eat it. There's a, a difference between varieties. And so taste your food and really um, see if you can discern the difference. And um, maybe an heirloom garden is all about fragrance, says Mar Marilyn Barlow, that heirloom peonies around my house have no name yet they have a fragrance that makes me weak in the knees um, and maybe it's about preserving history says William Royce I can't hardly say his name Royce Weaver the historian here today gone tomorrow unless we preserve something it will disappear and he became a, a seed saver when he found his grandfather had been saving seeds in his freezer and he never knew that about his grandfather until he was cleaning out the freezer and and found all these seeds and now he's he's grown them out and has a, a seed collection called the rough wood seed collection um, and a few designs from my book. I, I, I really like to do theme garden designs. It's, it seems to be a fun way to design gardens rather just, than just growing all kinds of edible things. And, and I like to inspire people by, by thinking up things that you might not grow. So the flow, Slow Food Arc of Taste Garden is all about old endangered varieties. If any of you know Slow Food, it's an organization that started in Italy that 
um, to preserve different artisan foods and, and um, livestock and um, crops. And so growing a slow food garden, you're preserving a lot of the old varieties that are at risk of, of being gone forever. Some of the, the Cherokee purple tomato and the, the husk cherry, the Aunt Molly's husk cherry. And of course, all a lot of these heirlooms have a wonderful story behind them. Or maybe it's the herbs, greens and aromatics garden. And you can just grow a tiny garden with, with rucola, rucola or beet greens or chervil and Claytonia and and just harvest a wonderful healthy um, healthy salad for um, yourself in the spring and and make it grow all summer and fall. So as uh, gardeners, I think we have a responsibility to share what we love with our, others. And, and um, in your community, I know you're doing a lot of civic work to, to share what you love with others. And it's important to, to keep it going because you know we, we have such a knowledge that we need to pass along to that next generation. Um, and to remember to play with your food in the garden and in the kitchen, um, because there's really only two things in life that money can't grow. Uh, true love and homegrown heirloom tomatoes. So I want to say thank you very much. Um, this is my new book, The New Heirloom Garden, and um, it's available in bookstores everywhere, or you can order it from me. Um, and please follow me on Instagram. So I'm going to stop sharing. And you can unmute and ask me questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was really, really fabulous. Um, I, when my husband and I were first married, we had a little um, garden with a fence around it. And we did so many of the things that you've described here. We had a little pea, pea stone path and the trellis and all kinds of things. It's, this is making me very nostalgic for that garden. Somewhere along the way, we, we got busy with life and stopped gardening, but hopefully we can get food gardening, but we can get back there. Um, so <laughs> Um, one question I have is, uh, where, you know, where would you recommend um, going to for these heirloom seeds now? I, I looked to see if you still had your catalog. Do you, do you still have your catalog? No, the catalog um, disappeared about 10 years ago, I'd say. Okay. Um, and um, there's a lot of good sources for heirloom seeds. I have a list on a, a uh, on my website, on my blog, I posted something. And of course, in my book, I list them. But um, I tend to recommend the smaller organic seed companies rather than going with the, the big ones. I know a lot of people, when they think of heirloom seeds, they think of Baker Creek, which is a big color flashy photo, you know, catalog and people like it. I prefer something simpler like the Seed Savers Exchange. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite seed catalogs is called Fruition Seeds, which is in Ithaca, New York. I get a lot of my, my um, salad greens from wild garden seeds and select seeds in Connecticut has wonderful old fashioned flowers. So those are sort of my four favorites, I would say. That's great. And one more quick question, and that is um, to, you know, to get back into vegetable gardening or food gardening. Um, I'm not sure that I have it within me to, to do a big garden <laughs> right now. So if I wanted to chip away at it, what, what would be your recommendation? Would it be for planters? Would it be for you know, some smaller raised beds? Like, you know, how would you, how would you approach, you know, basically eating this elephant, so yeah. to speak. Um, well, um, well, first of all, I'm thrilled that you wanna get back into it again. And I'm sure you have it in you to design something really beautiful. And so what I do, what I've been teaching in my garden design classes is um, not starting with the seeds and what you wanna grow, but really to start with an, over, an overview of your landscape and how it would fit in. And the beauty of a kitchen garden is it technically should be right outside your kitchen door. My grandmother always had this, had a big garden for years and then she had a tiny garden outside her That's kitchen where yeah. she could get the onions simmering and then run out and grab some basil and so yeah. small is beautiful I think when it comes to kitchen gardens we all have access to wonderful farmers markets right now but just being able to grow herbs and salad greens and those those little things you want on a daily basis there's such a thrill so I wouldn't grow the big stuff I would just grow the small stuff um, so if you can start by looking at your landscape 
you know, plotting it with your house and, and, you know, where things are and then sort of figuring out where east, west, north, south is and then, and then doing the small design, maybe using a template from one of my books. Um, that's really where I start everybody. And then you figure out what you want to plant. But um, honestly, there's, there's never enough room. I've been growing all of my herbs in big whiskey barrels, which I don't, they perfectly they work pretty well, you know. Um, yeah. I don't really like er, um, raised beds. I have to say, I'm one of these people. I'm kind of anti-raised beds. Well, for the reason I showed you, but I think they they have a place. If you have an urban garden and you don't have room, and you or you have something wrong with the soil, but to me, soil is key, you know. And that really working with your soil is important. And so often um, we get raised beds, and then we use bag soil. And then what do you do with bag soil? You know, it doesn't have worms and it, it doesn't have anything in it. It's just bagged soil. And when you're really working with your own soil, it may not be great, but you can add cover crops and compost and build it up. Um, you saw my soil, it's like chocolate cake. And, and I love my soil. I have a relationship with my soil, which sounds kind of silly, but I do. <laughs> I am. Uh, and I just think that's the fun part about gardening. Yeah, that, that's great. I love that you're that you're talking about the soil because I think it's oftentimes neglected. In fact, Sean and I were just recently having a conversation about how we should have that as a topic for Garden Club one of these days. Yeah. Thank you. This has been really fabulous. I can't wait to get your book. Oh, good. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, would you ever let us, I'm, I'm in charge of field trips, so um, <laughs> would you ever let us come and visit your garden? Just thought I'd ask. Oh, you're so nice. Um, of course I would, but I'm a long way from from where you are, and my garden, you know, it's small. I, a, a camera really, does, of course. I mean, of course, yes. But I could recommend some other gardens. You know, a lot of the gardens I showed you are gardens that I went to visit. But I'd be happy to talk with you, Sheila, about some interesting gardens to go see. Um, okay. So, what would be? What was your? What really inspired you? That's relatively close, so we don't need to get on a plane and go to Italy. We can't do that. <laughs> but we'd love to. We would love to, but it's just not really in the cards right now. Um, um, what was, if there was something locally that you, you know, really inspired you and what would you say, where, where should we go? Where, where you are now? You mean in, in the Boston area? Well, we're all pretty, uh, like Victoria's all the way down on the Cape. So we we're we're willing to travel, not to Italy, but we are willing to kind of, if yeah. it's something really great, but I, I, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, when I first started learning this, I just, I signed up for all the garden conservancy tour, you know, the garden conservancy, and they have this thing called open days tours where you right. can visit people's gardens. And I did that like nonstop every weekend. Okay. And um, I learned so much and saw so many gardens and there's some in your area. I know there's one out um, beyond Concord called the clock tower garden. Have you, did you ever go see her garden? Yeah, um, it's it's, op it's only open certain times. That's it's on yeah, my it's list. private garden. It's yeah. definitely a private garden. Right. Um, but Sheila, why don't you and I chat? I'll, I just have to think about it um, and figure it out. I mean, I think that most of the gardens that I've seen that are magnificent are in the, um, you know, the Litchfield County area. Yeah. Uh, open days, and um, you know, like Bunny Williams Garden is always open on the Garden Conservancy Day, and um, okay. Uh, you know some some of those that that's where I went to see the oh I'm losing track of of names at this point I'm sorry but <laughs> <laughs> then I will reach out to you but you know what's really exciting is that when I first started going on those garden conservancy tours there were no vegetable gardens I mean I went to visit and I I'm going to use a name Gordon Haywood who I respect tremendously is a wonderful designer I love his garden. He's in Putney, Vermont. And actually there's some, oh, there's some really good gardens coming up on the Garden Conservancy tour for um, Putney, Vermont and New Hampshire and stuff. And those are, those are nice gardens. And those are a day trip from Boston. Okay. Um, but his garden, he didn't, he, his vegetable garden was in the shade and it was all falling down. And I would keep saying, Gordon, let me design your garden for you. Let me get a garden in there. But some people don't really care about growing food. And I, makes me a little sad but now there's a lot of beautiful gardens on those garden conservancy tours i mean everybody's putting in gorgeous garden food gardens so it's fun right thank you thank you very much i have i have a question yes um the ferry seed company out yeah. of detroit dexter ferry um they're now i guess they've been um 
absorbed by other larger uh, seed companies, but the name has remained and they're evidently headquartered now down in Norton, Massachusetts. Huh. Um, uh, do you have any uh, comment on the Dexter Seed Company? Because as I understand it, they were the Dexter Ferry sort of invented the seed packet. And that was part of the contribution of the Dexter Seed Company. Yeah. The seed uh, distribution. Well, that's the key, distribution. So here's my thing. And I'm going to get tired of hearing my voice talk. But um, you really, I mean, they're middlemen in seeds. So you basically, a seed company buys seeds from somebody who sells seeds, who's buying them from somebody who's been growing seeds, you don't really know how old that seed is. I mean, it could be three or four years. You don't know how it's been grown. You don't know if it's been grown with chemicals. You don't, you really don't know. I mean, you, you may get a variety of things, but you don't, the actual seed is, yeah. is so precious, I think. So I recommend going to the source, going to, to places where they're growing their own seed, like wild garden seed in Oregon grows their own seed and their seed is so fresh that you put it in the ground and you turn around three times and it's already come out of the ground. You know a seed is old when you put it in the ground and it takes like 10 days to germinate because I mean, not all seed, but you know, because all seed germinates at different times, but what you want is fresh, viable seed. And so if you can find local seed companies that are growing their own or at least using or, you know, organic methods and, um, I just think there's this whole surge of, of new seed companies that are starting. Like that's why I recommend fruition seed. They grow a lot of their own seeds and sell them direct to the consumer. So you're getting a very fresh crop. Um, and then, you know, some people buy seeds in the hardware store, or the garden center, they think they're getting fresh seed. That's seed from last year that was packed up in September and shipped to those, those garden centers in, in December so they could put them out in January. Um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And it's frustrating to me because I think that sometimes people put them in the ground and they don't work. And then they think, oh, I'm not a good gardener. Well, it has nothing to do with if you're a good gardener or it's not, just they weren't good seeds. And um, so I'm, I have a whole ramp, <laughs> rant on seeds, I'm sorry. Is but, that included in any of your books? Um, um, I didn't want to get too political in my book. I must say it's sort of why I wrote the new heirloom and I'm kind of thinking of doing another book on it, but um, not really. <laughs> it's just what I, in conversation, how I feel about mm -hmm. seeds. I'm, I'm very much a protector of seeds. I think seeds, I'm looking behind me because I usually have seeds on my shelves behind me. You know, when you hold a seed, it's so exquisite what is inside that seed, you know? And, and so often we just rip up that packet and push those seeds in the ground without ever taking the time to think where was this seed grown and and what is the history of this seed and and what you know just all these things about seeds that we just don't even think about because mm -hmm. we're so used to just buying seeds and putting them in the ground mm -hmm. yeah so is this um understanding about the provenance of seeds uh becoming a, a large enough movement that it's having any any kind of um, impact on the mass distribution industry? <laughs> wow, um, I don't know. But a good it's a good question. Um, I think we can all do our own part to 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 find sources that we like. Um, yes, I think it is. I think there's a lot of things going on in the seed business that it, I mean, I'm not a, a plant breeder or seed genes, geneticist, so I can't really speak on behalf of that, but I do think it's it's a time that we're paying attention to seeds because a lot of people are ordering seeds and they can't buy seeds, so now they're looking at growing their own open pollinated and heirloom seeds, at least some of them. I mean, I'll still buy seeds, but I'll, I'll save a certain portion of my own seeds. I think it's important to, to, to learn more if we can, yeah. Um, your talk was wonderful. Well, thank and you. I was wondering if we could hire you on a short term basis to be a consultant. I mean, <laughs> we're designing, starting out designing something. Oh, well, you're all welcome to join my design class. Um, I, I'm, 
I don't know when I'm, I'm going to be offering it again. I'm, I'm right in the middle of one now. And then um, I think I'll, I don't know if I'm going to continue it. If I get enough people, I can do it, but um, I'll start it again in the fall. So you can sign up, send me an email. I actually have an intro class. So if you send me an email, I'll put you on the list and keep you informed, but that's very sweet of you. <laughs> it was great. Hi, Anne. Yes. There's one more question in the chat from Linda Lyons. Yes. Quick question about the source in Chatham for the Ray Cedar style gardens. Oh, well, I, I, I mentioned that, but they're not really open to the public. But if you go online and you look at a place called Farmstead, Farmstead Raised Beds, um, <coughs> and it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's a very small place, but um, he there shipped- you go. We are unclicked. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask a question? Mm-hmm. Yes. Hi. Hi, Sherry. I'm an artichoke. I'm crazy about artichokes. And yeah. how long, I haven't grown artichokes in years, like 24, how long do they, I mean, when do you, mm. where do you get those seeds? Yeah. Um, artichokes probably should have been started last month. So, but sometimes oh. you can find them in the nursery. I started growing them because my local nursery has plants that I can buy that oh. are this high. And the thing about artichokes that I've learned is they like cool weather to start with. They actually like a few nights of frost that will set their buds. Mm. Um, but you can easily start seed if you want to plant, put it on your calendar for next year, order some seeds and start them like um, I'm trying to think in your client. Are you in the Boston area? So start them in right February. the vineyard. Martha's or, Vineyard. Martha's yeah. Vineyard. Yeah. For the vineyard gals. Yeah. Well, there might be, I mean, there might be some in your local nursery because it's an ornamental plant and sometimes they're they're available. But yes, you can start it from seed. Oh, okay. I just wanted to thank you. And I want to say days. um I was in Stratton for about eight years of my life, and your green greenery right now in the summer is the most you have the most lush gardens in the area i've uh -huh. ever seen i mean the southern vermont art center walking up and there are just so many beautiful gardens mm -hmm. that people have i mean and everyone there in your manchester area loves to garden i mean they just throw stuff they make it <laughs> they're so creative and I have friends in Charlotte that really, um, it looks like one of their gardens. And when about 40 years ago, um, my husband and I had a 150 acre farm that I did nothing but a ton of gardening. Wow. That's why I can't remember how to grow artichokes again. That was my yeah. issue. So yeah. where do I, where would I source um, artichokes? So let me think where I get my seeds. I think I, there's different kinds of artichokes, but there's, I think green, green glow. Look in the Johnny's catalog. I think the Johnny's catalog carries them. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe fruition seed carries them. Um, fruition seed? Yeah. Okay, so, and you know, we are members of the Martha Vineyard Garden Club here and we have our own little nursery. And I just didn't know if they had, I'll find out if they have any artichokes that are like this, would that be too late? Well, you don't need them, no, you need them small. You need them small, you know, you don't oh. want them big. But yes, you could get somebody, you might get, get a packet of seeds and ask somebody to start them for you. You know, Martha's Vineyard, they're actually a biennial, so they will grow two years in a row. They don't grow that way for me in Vermont. But if you get them started, you could probably keep them in the ground, fairly sheltered, get one of those old fashioned cloches you can put over them or something, or put hay down. And then, yeah, probably come back again. And while I'm having a lot of fun right now transplanting my hydrangeas, we have hydrangeas. This is hydrangea capital of the world up yeah. here. I mean, <laughs> And I've got uh, irises right now. I'm transplanting like crazy. It's like so all of a sudden it's warm enough to be outside to garden. So anyway, it's been a pleasure. I love this. Uh, oh, I'm lecture. so glad. I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, okay. Well, thanks. I'll look into Johnny and uh, fruition. Fruition. Okay. Thanks. Can I ask so, one more question?
question. So, Ellen, I think it's safe to say you're you're going to hear a lot of uh, follow up, have a lot of follow up and feedback from oh, us. Good. One That's last good. question, and then we'll adjourn. Okay, I also have a question. Um, I have a large garden. I'm Ann Johnson. And I have a large garden in Wellesley. That's a community garden with our daughter, and yes. it's about fifty feet square. Wow. And I'm asking you the question about um, what is your recommendation for feeding this garden? Um, should we? What kind of? What kind of? Um, what kind of materials should I use for a soil amendment or for natural fertilizer? Mm. Are you having any problems right now? No, not particularly, but I think we need to feed it. I think <laughs> the last couple of years, we've noticed that the produce is not quite as yeah. virulent as it well, has you know, been. Mast, mast, a master gardener would say, get a soil test and see yes, what Yes, of course, need. right. Um, and, um, if you have access to compost, it, maybe there's a local farm nearby, you could get some nice aged um, compost. Manure, compost. The soil is very dark and rich. Nice. But I, I still think it needs to be. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, soil is, I can't really answer that without knowing it particularly, but yes. um, what I put on mine is I lime it because you know we're in Vermont and it's lime is good for everything. And then I actually use a Progro, which is an organic fertilizer uh, 534 on it. Um, and That's pro grow. Pro grow, yeah. And um, and then I do cover crops in the fall, but you don't need to do that just yet. Um, but the key is, is really soil doesn't like to be disturbed too much. So just make sure it gets weeded, but I wouldn't use a rototiller in it. It's no, really, no, no. Really good just to turn it gently. And, yes. um, but maybe just watch to see what it needs in terms of the plant. Okay. If it okay. needs, if, if it's the vigor of the plants, again, it could be the seeds, not the soil. Yes. Um, yes. But soil does like to be rejuvenated as much as possible, and that's it's great that you're doing that with your daughter. What a wonderful project! It is. It is, and we pay uh, the town. $70 a year for it, our water supply and all the spigots. I found a Hudson Valley Seed Company is a yeah. good one. Yeah. Have you heard of it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, no, they're good. They're good. I mean, it's really- I have, I have all my seeds already. That's, that's great. Yeah, no, there's a lot of good small seed companies um, that are giving the big, the big boys a run for their money. I'll put it that way. <laughs> and I've also used for years territorial out in Oregon. Very good. Very yes. Good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, you know, I mean, at one point, seeds were regional. You know, there'd be the southern seeds and the northern seed things that were grown best in the. And I'm actually, um, I'm going to be starting. I, I'm hoping to start. I'm planning on it. Um, a seed library. Do you know what a seed library is? Mm -hmm. um, you can picture with a book, and that's how Hudson Valley started was with as a seed library, and that people would oh, borrow really? seeds and then they bring <laughs> seeds back, and that's something that was done by libraries. And I, um, I'm, I'm giving a presentation in in Vermont. We have like six or seven seed libraries, so I'm doing a presentation for them, um, and I just want to encourage more libraries to be seed libraries. But what I want to do, I see, I, I'm I'm not tired of talking yet. Um, <laughs> I want to get kids involved in seed libraries and I'm trying to figure out how to get kids involved in gardening and it seems to me if we can teach them about seeds by planting the seeds and letting it grow and then having all these seeds I mean it's incredible that a sunflower can grow from one seed and it can produce, produce 150 different you right. know more seeds it's just incredible and I just think kids could get so excited about gardening if we started them with seeds. Can I ask one simple question? Yes Judy. Yes, um, for the four square um, organic crop garden, you start with seeds, go to roots, and then the it's fruits and flowers and then leaves? Or is it fruits and flowers or is it something else? Um, there's legumes. Oh yeah, legumes. Legumes, um, and then go, legumes go into root crops. Right. Root crops go into fruits and flowers. Okay. And then fruits and flowers go into leafy greens. Uh -huh. And then the leafy greens go into the legumes. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, everyone right, else. Time on that time. note, we'll wrap us up for today. Thank you so much for a okay, wonderful everybody. meeting. Nice to meet all of you.